Hey ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the channel. As always, it is Nick here, back to your daily crypto news and analysis. And today we are going to be talking about Ripple and XRP as well as the vast majority of crypto and finance. I hope everyone is having a great day or a great night. Um, we have a lot to go over in this video, so I don't want to waste time at all. Uh, we did get a release data on cross-border payments for 2023 from Statista.com. And uh, as you guys do see here, the market value for cross-border payments is now $190 trillion up from the original $156 trillion market size in 2022. They are projecting this market to be worth almost $300 trillion by 2030, so within the next seven years. Now, this is no surprise as we have been talking about cross-border payments for a while and how fast this market does grow. It will most likely continue to grow much faster than what most people actually anticipate, meaning these projected values could very well grow um, rapidly to much higher valuations. And the reason for this is the new technology. Now, I focus on cross-border payments, obviously, because this has been the biggest market that Ripple has been addressing with utilizing XRP. Um, but outside of this, this is a market that is extremely ripe for disruption. And I do think that crypto will be at the heart of this market. Um, almost every single central bank out there is looking at how we can make cross-border payments more efficient. How can we you know, upgrade uh, payment technology around cross-border uh, cross payments? And how can we achieve instant settlements? So as we do look at this, right, there's a few things that we have to talk about in this video. One, the pyramid banking system structure. So a lot of people think that, you know, we are so reliant on the U.S. Federal Reserve and, you know, we have to pay attention to these major banks. But at the height of this, you have the banker elite and then you have the BIS. Now, you could tie these banker elites to the BIS, to the IMF, to the central banks and all that. Um, but at the top of this, in my opinion, is the BIS. The BIS and the IMF and even the World Bank are the key three players around global financial system structuring. Um, these three names have all been tied back to utilizing DLT. How can we utilize crypto? I mean, hell, the BIS just recently did a massive collaboration with the Bank of England and Quant on interoperability between our payment systems and DLTs. So... As we look at this, yes, a restructuring of the banking system is underway and it is all hyper-focused on digital payments and digital technology. Recently, there's been a lot of developments happening around cross-border payments and going all the way back to January of this year, shout out to Matthew Lin Y, the IMF January 2023 document, Tobias Adrian, which you guys probably remember from a recent video that I talked about, uh, Cross-border payments for the 21st century. No direct mention of Ripple, HBAR, Algo, or any other you know, major technology, but these projects are working directly with central banks and regulators. Check this out. Tobias Adrian, cross-border payments for the 21st century. Over within this, we do see a few things that they are talking about. So one, there are three ingredients in the technology that are important that are being used. One is tokenization of payments. In particular, we envision a world where central bank reserves are tokenized so that you can trade these reserves across border in a multi-currency fashion. Tokenized dollars can be exchanged against, say, tokenized euros or tokenized yens in a way that creates trust. That's number one. Also, focus on the word trust here. Number two, we have heard a lot about DLT. We have in mind a common ledger, a shared ledger, a unified ledger, if you guys do remember from the recent videos, is a key one that they've been focused on. It doesn't necessarily share all the information, sort of like identity information. Your social security number would not be shared across borders, but the basic information that each other needs to know to trust transactions would be shared. It's a common ledger. Then thirdly, it would use smart contracts. You could do not just spot transactions, but also state contingent transactions like options or futures or risk management tools. Something a little bit more complicated. In principle, it could be the basis for sophisticated financial products. Then over here, of course, with uh, third, they do say it has a lack of identity. I mean, Bitcoin is fundamentally constructed to be anonymous in order to evade governments. And of course, from a government or a policy perspective, you want to have identity because you want to make sure that whoever makes those payments is responsible for the payments he or she makes. 
uh, but the technology can be used for policy purposes, and that is what we are proposing it to be used for. Certain technological innovations such as tokenization, ledgers, which are not distributed ledgers, but common ledgers, and then a smart contract in a way that works from a central bank, from a finance ministry, from a government's perspective. And then last but not least, they do also talk about uh, what makes me very confident is that we're heading in the right direction, is that the private sector is innovating and is already operating systems that are somewhat similar to what we are proposing. But the private sector cannot tokenize central bank reserves. The private sector can tokenize their own deposits, but that is never as liquid as a trustworthy as tokenizing central bank reserves. There's a clear role for the public sector relative to what the private sector is doing, but what the private sector is doing is both in philosophy and technology very closely related to what we are proposing. This is why I'm confident that it is both feasible and desirable. Yes, prosperity payment innovation is crucial. And of course, from Tobias Adrian going all the way back to March of 2020. That's right, over three years ago. Shout out to XRP underscore Crow for this. International payments are expensive and the structure is not very well built. Ripple is an example because it has new technology that increases financial inclusion. This is literally from Tobias Adrian himself. And, you know, uh, a large part of the population in the world doesn't have access to bank accounts. Um, and even if it does have access to bank accounts, those are extremely expensive. It's expensive to make payments, wirements, international payments. So I think one of the big motivations for this new technology, right, because Augustine is asking why, is that there's huge financial exclusion and these technologies have proven to increase financial inclusion enormously. So I think you have to look broadly around the world. Uh, I think this is one motivation and I think the, the Ripple example is one example, or, you know, and, and Norman has talked about that, is that international payments are, are very expensive. and. The structure is not very well built. And, you know. and of course, as you guys do see him when he mentions Ripple, he, he looks to his, uh, his left. That's because Brad Garlinghouse is there. That's right. This is that meeting where you have pictures of Christine Lagarde, Brad Garlinghouse, the IMF directors. Yeah, Ripple sitting right at the top of the food chain with some of the largest names out there around some of the largest groups, the private sector themselves. The individuals that make changes for our financial system. Hmm, interesting. Also, recently, June 19th, that's right, just a couple days ago, the IMF envisions a new class of cross-border payment platform with single ledger, the XC platform. This is what it's called, the XC platform. Could operate domestically using tokenized assets, including deposits with or without CBDCs. Interesting. You know why they're saying with or without CBDCs? Because central banks are moving towards stable coins as well. Remember that global stable coin um, document that I was talking about? Yeah, they're trying to create this harmonized approach in terms of a, a regulatory framework around global stable coins. Also, within this, there's a few things. So here we have IMF officials chose a roundtable on CBDC policy to reveal their new platform concept on June 19th at the event held in conjunction with the Central Bank of Morocco. Oh, this is pretty interesting. The, the Central Bank of Morocco. Do you guys know? Do you know who's working with Morocco's largest bank? I'll give you guys a second. Oh, yeah, that's right. Ripple. Going all the way back to 2022. Morocco's largest bank joins RippleNet. <laughs> you can't make this up. And guess what? Let's zoom in just so everyone out there can see. Check this out. Last month, CEO Brad Garlinghouse announced that Ripple had... It's best year to date with on-demand liquidity, a payment solution that uses XRP as a bridge currency, now accounting for a fourth of all transactions. And then down here, the head of international cash management at the uh, Rabat-based bank describes blockchain as fast and foolproof way of transferring money. By the way, this bank is also sharing, um, whose shares are trading on the Casablanca stock exchange, has more than 4,900 branches in the UK, China, Madrid, Tunisia, and other countries. Yeah, this is a very large bank. Um, I would say the name, but I, I would just butcher the name of the bank. But um, yeah, this is a very large bank. And of course, Ripple is working with them on B2B cross-border payments. Big deal. Very large deal. 
And again, here we have from the IMF talking about central bank digital currencies and cross-border payments and how can we make these transactions faster. Um, and it's literally held in conjunction with the Central Bank of Morocco. Um, but here we have uh, what he said. Some of $45 billion paid to remittance providers every year may then go back into the pockets of the poor. He's talking about how expensive these transactions are. He's also talking about you know, how we could have lower fees and faster transaction times themselves. In addition, the platform would help central banks intervene in foreign exchange markets, aggregate information on capital flows, and resolve disputes. The platform could be adapted for domestic wholesale and retail CBDCs as well. The details of platform dubbed the XC cross-border payments and contracting platform were laid out in the IMF FinTech note co-authored by Adrian and released the same day, which don't worry, we have that document. XC platforms offer a trusted single layer, a document representing pro uh, property rights on which standardized digital represent uh, representations of central bank reserves, sorry, in any currency can be exchanged. Um, yeah, this is very interesting. Now, the big thing is, is that yes, this will be focused on cross-border payments, but what about liquidity? Liquidity would still come from institutions with reserve accounts. So again, they're more so centered out on, um, they're, they're still focused on the Nasha Vasha accounts, I'm pretty sure with this. So we still need to disrupt that. Um, with that, I do think that that is where XRP will play a vital role. Um, of course, that's just me assuming. Um, but this is still very interesting to see them talking about this XC platform. This is the new platform uh, that they've been talking about. But with that, here we have exploring cross-border payments and domestic payments and contracting platforms. This was that June 19th announcement around this XC platform. Within this, this is still centered out on cryptography, tokenization, and programmability themselves um, to improve money. Um, also, Within this, we do see, today I would like to explore some of the infrastructure behind money and present a blueprint for improvements, a new class of cross-border payments and domestic payments and contracting platforms. My aim is to paint a picture and inspire many of you to pick up your own brushes like the remarkable artisans in Rabat's Medina and continue to refine the painting. I will argue that today's new technologies allow the public sector to renew the infrastructure supporting cross-border payments and possibly domestic ones as well. This will bring people together through faster and cheaper payments and countries together through a more stable and cohesive international monetary system. It's about technology, but it's also about governance, which establishes the roles of the game. These are tricky, tri uh, tricky to establish, but an organization such as the IMF, with its wide membership focus on macro financial interactions and well-oiled interna uh, internal governance, can help countries build consensus. Again, as we do look at this, right, you scroll down to the future of cross-border payments. Again, this is something that Ripple has been spearheading for so, so long. Um, I've talked about cross-border payments and why this is probably one of the first major markets to really see a huge, huge innovation through this type of technology, but they are focused heavily on Morocco. And it's wild to have Ripple already centered out in Morocco going all the way back to 2022. So again, I'm trying to connect the dots here. Um, all of this is centered out on settlement times, operational cost, things like that, and how can we get over these major obstacles? But also, what's crazier about all of this is down here, steps are being taken in a strong show of multilateral cooperation. The international community is enhancing cross-border payments following the G20's 2020 roadmap. They're still talking about a 2020 roadmap. This is why I say, you know, don't focus on the time frame itself. Things take time. And here they are literally referencing a 2020 roadmap. More than ever, the IMF, the World Bank, the BIS, and the FSB have been tightly collaborating, each bringing its comparative advantage to the table. You know what's crazy about all of this? The IMF, the World Bank, the BIS, and even the FSB have all major connections to Ripple still. For an example, here you have the World Bank. Central Bank Digital Currencies for Cross-Border Payments, November of 2021. The only two assets, the only two assets within this mentioned that are actual crypto assets, XRP, XLM. The only two. This is that extremely popular PDF file talking about stable coins for cross-border payments. The only two mentioned here are XRP and XLM. Also, they do mention the FSB. Yeah. 
Here you guys have Ripple's response to the FSB in terms of uh, regulations. December 15th, 2022. What do you see? They welcome the opportunity to comment on the international regulation of crypto asset activities, a proposed framework. The wild thing about this, right, is that the FSB is the one in charge of a global crypto framework. The G20 has charged the FSB with uh, coordinating the delivery of an effective and comprehensive regulatory framework for crypto assets. In 2023, the FSB will finalize its recommendations for the regulation, supervision, and oversight of crypto assets and markets, and its recommendations targeted at global stablecoin arrangements, which have characteristics that may make threats to financial stability more acute. Again, they are working closely with the IMF, the BIS, also the World Bank, and also the G20 themselves have given the FSB a job to create this global regulatory framework for crypto assets. This is why I say the SEC is not going to bring out, you know, regulations for crypto. Crypto will not have regulations from the, uh, from the SEC. It's going to be from, from major names like the FSB, for an example, through the G20, or maybe even Congress themselves will give the U.S. a possible regulatory framework. But it's not going to be the, the SEC. It just won't. But also, the IMF, right? Going back to this, here we have the framework for the XC platform. It's talking about settlement and settlement layers. The wild thing about this is that if we go over to this document, here we have the rise of payment and contracting platforms. This is from 2023. This is just from recently, June 2023. Now, down here, there is something very interesting, and they actually show the platform itself. Uh, but first, they do show us cross-border payments via correspondent banking. We do see Bank A, Bank B. We also see Nostro accounts being here, uh, which is transferring central bank reserves to the purple bank itself. Um, again, a lot of problems tied to this. Uh, but then down here, we also do see the XC platforms, the settlement layer transferring tokenized central bank reserves. Um, this is very interesting as well um, because they do kind of go in depth on what we've been talking about for a while around Ripple um, platforms. So here we have a simple cross-border payment via the XC platform. We have Bank A, Bank B, the reserve tokens, settlement programming, information management. Um, again, really kind of similar to what we've seen in the past around like a lot of these uh, payment platforms. But down here, we do see when a customer of the green bank in the green country wishes to pay a customer of the purple bank in the purple country, the green bank transfers central bank reserves to an escrow account and receives a tokenized version of them, which it can exchange and transfer on the XC platform to the, to the uh, purple bank. Tokenized versions of all participating countries' reserves depicted in different colors can also be exchanged on the platform. The question is, what's going to tokenize these uh, these reserves? What's going to provide the liquidity? Because again, they are mentioning like how this contributes to improving market liquidity. In my opinion, there has to be some sort of settlement platform here. There has to be some type of uh, settlement token that is going to settle all of these. It's definitely interesting to see them talking about this um, and addressing this because you know, this is the first time that we're actually seeing a lot of these platforms being mentioned from some large names like the IMF, for example. They do mention a few um, existing public blockchains. More so, we will most likely see a private blockchain um, being utilized here, which I'll talk to you guys about here in a second. Um, they also do talk about proof of work as used in Bitcoin uses excessive energy and proof of stake such as in Ethereum can be costly in terms of validation fees and remains relatively untested. So when we look at two of these, they're already out. Bitcoin and Ethereum are out of the picture. What's the only other ledger technology within the space that's been around for over a decade that's been tried, tested, and true? Oh, yeah, that's right. XRP. Pretty interesting, right? Um, so, yeah, as we do look at that, we also see, and third, the technologies available for digital uh, validation are not especially scalable, efficient, or private. These are the key ones that uh, they're looking at. Now, I will talk to you guys uh, about something here in a second that's going to really show you something very interesting around xrp um but last but not least i just want to go down to the last summed up variation of this let me scroll all the way to the bottom so here we have the conclusion so as innovation tugs ahead and payments evolve the public sector too should consider renewing its infrastructure 
New technologies, new entrants, and new needs have opened a window of opportunity to think amb um, ambitiously and improve domestic and cross-border payment systems while continuing to pursue public policy objectives such as financial and monetary stability. So as we do look at this, yes, uh, we are seeing the new technology that we've been addressing for so long on this channel now um, becoming a crucial piece of the puzzle for upgrading and ultimately innovating our financial system. It's happening. It's becoming a big deal. Um, now, who's going to be the major player here? Well, going, going back to uh, March of 2023. That's right, March of this year. Trust, bridges, and money flows. Remember when I said to focus on the word trust? Yeah, here you guys have trust, bridges, and money flows. A digital marketplace to improve cross-border payments. That's very interesting because over here, they're literally talking about a settlement platform. A marketplace, if you will. It's very interesting to see them uh, talking about this. Like I said, this is all happening this year as well. And who's on uh, who, who's on this PDF file too? Oh yeah, that's right, Tobias Adrian, as well as a few other major names from the IMF. Now what's crazier about all of this is that the only two major assets mentioned on this are XRP and oh yeah, that's right, just a stablecoin, USDC. No XLM, just XRP. Where is it mentioned? Down here. Now, we already seen them mention uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum and wrote them off. Here is uh, three models. Now, they are talking about this. So first off, we have fifth. An important question is who builds and operates such a marketplace and which roles will govern it? International financial organizations could do so since they've already have well-established governance standards and some experience in making international transfers to and from central banks. Another question is whether the public or private sector should be or will be involved. While the most efficient or socially desirable setup may be debated, the private sector is rapidly building this infrastructure. Again, these are the private sector players. Like, for example, Ripple and Stellar. Now, they are talking about this marketplace, and it must not fragment foreign exchange markets globally. A trade-off seemingly uh, arises. The more liquidity rises on the digital marketplace, the less liquidity may exist on other, more conventional foreign exchange markets. And markets should become fragmented in the sense of trading the same currency pairs at different uh, prices. The simple solution is ensuring that the digital marketplace is open to market makers that also take part in more conventional foreign exchange markets so they may efficiently arbitrage any price deviations away. Indeed, a key characteristic of the marketplace is its openness to participants of any size given the low trading costs and significant transparency. You know what's wild about this? Scroll down. Check this out. A private, private. A private settlement asset and marketplace such as Ripple's XRP. They are literally confirming that Ripple with XRP could very well be XRP being the private settlement asset and Ripple creating this private marketplace for these private players, meaning the bank to bank, the big players going all the way back to the start. The wholesale players. These are the wholesale players over here. One hundred and fifty trillion dollars, two hundred and thirty trillion dollars by 2030 and there's a lot more money tied to this because you remember like they're going to tokenize reserves and even deposits this is a big deal now also around the this uh trust bridges um pdf file if you actually look up a marketplace within this there's a few things here so one the paper considers a global clearinghouse that eliminates a need for a complete set of bilateral trust relationships and ends by advancing a model for a marketplace to trade tokenized money directly across borders again this is something that I'm very, very focused on as well because, you know, trading something across borders and, and specifically settling tokenized money, you need a bridge currency. And I think that this is their goal in terms of what Ripple has been focused on with XRP. Also, down here, the cross-country marketplace model with tokenized money. This is that marketplace. One possible model to enhance cross-border payments is to establish a marketplace on a digital platform to trade tokenized money across borders. I mean, they literally are talking about what we've been addressing with what Ripple's doing with XRP. Down here, a marketplace trading only privately issued monies would be riskier though possible as well. Talking about CBDCs and uh, you know even stable coins. And then there's a few other ones in here as well. Fifth, an important question. This is what I just went over. Then they also do mention you know a marketplace around uh, DeFi networks, but also the, the private settlement asset marketplace such as Ripple's XRP. I mean, this is... Uh, this is something very interesting, and it's all centered out on cross-border payments, settling cross-border payments, and making them a lot more efficient around tokenized money.
It is wild to me. And also, mind you, a new document that has been surfacing, that's been, I should say, it's an old document, but a lot of people are looking at it as a newer document. Um, ISO 2022, let's do it over on Twitter, post this. Bank of International Settlements cites Ripple as a, crypt a cryptocurrency that employs a permission model of designating trusted nodes. Check this out. One class is based on permission DLT, such as cryptocurrencies are similar to conventional payment mechanisms in that to prevent abuse, the ledger can only be updated by trusted participants in the cryptocurrency, often termed trusted nodes. These nodes are chosen by and subject to oversight by a central authority, e.g. the firm that developed the cryptocurrency. Thus, while cryptocurrencies based on permission systems differ from conventional money in terms of how transaction records are stored, decentralized versus centralized, they share with it the re reliance on specific institutions as the ultimate source of trust. And here you guys have Ripple being mentioned. Current or planned examples of cryptocurrencies employing a permission model with designated trusted nodes include the coin to be issued by the Saga Foundation Ripple and Utility Settlement coin, um, which, yes, I mean, technically speaking, like this is that document from 2018. Um, the reason why I still bring up like, like these documents are still crucial to focus on because, again, they do mention Ripple. These are from some of the largest names out there around the banking sector. Um, and again, you know, as we do look at what's happening, I strongly believe that Ripple is becoming a major key player around this settlement mechanism um, or even marketplace. It could be a marketplace, right? Um, this is a big deal. A lot of these connections are very large and it's all centered out on trust. That's why they are even talking about a trust bridge, right? Trust bridges and money flows, a digital marketplace to improve cross-border payments. Like this is what I believe is happening, right? It's going to be a marketplace that centered out, it could very well be created by Ripple to settle the banks, the bank tokens, meaning it could be bank CBDCs, bank stable coins. It does not matter. We are going to see the rise of this digital marketplace. And I do believe that XRP and XLM are playing their roles. Um, they even mentioned Stellar as that open platform for more so retail sector. Um, but the big, the big money, in my opinion, will go towards something like Ripple with XRP. Um, but this is something very interesting to me. Let me know what you guys think down in the comments below. I know that this was a little bit of a longer video, but there's just so much information here. So with that being said, I hope that you guys enjoyed this video. If you guys did, definitely leave a like, subscribe, turn notifications on if you guys have more free content. You guys are more than welcome to follow me on Twitter and join the free Discord in the description below. Us uh, is up to you all. Have a beautiful day or a beautiful night. We hope you guys are on this beautiful world. This has been Nick. Peace out, guys.